In over 50 years of filmmaking, Alfred Hitchcock perfected the cinematic art of storytelling through the shaping of Cold War thrillers, tales of World War II era challenges, or classic suspense with memorable scenes taking place around real world landmarks and settings. But in 1949, Hitchcock directed one of his most innovative movies, the psychological drama Rope. Rope was based on the real-life crime of the century, the gruesome 1924 murder of 14-year-old boy Bobby Franks by wealthy Chicago teenagers Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, a story that was still fresh in people's minds a quarter century later. But how much of Rope was based on the facts of the actual murder, and how much was generated in the mind of the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock? For this episode of When the Pictures Got Bigger, we'll trace the history of one of the first of many crimes of the century, and try to dig deeper into the Hitchcock classic. And in an homage to the original film, I'll record all video and audio in one continuous YouTube session, with no editing or continuity tricks whatsoever. I'm truly embracing my inner Hitchcock here. First, let's start with a few basic details on the 1924 Chicago murder that, quite honestly, is still hard to fathom on its 100th anniversary. The 19-year-old Leopold and 18-year-old Loeb were already college graduates taking post-grad courses when they plotted and carried out a thrill murder of a random victim. Why? The two teenagers felt they were intellectually superior to the people around them, and boldly imagined they could prove this by carrying out the perfect crime. The plan tragically resulted in the murder of the 14-year-old Franks, a local private school student who happened to live just blocks away from the two killers in their wealthy Chicago neighborhood, and who was con coincidentally was a distant cousin of Loeb. The murder plot included a kidnap note sent to the victim's parents, but unraveled due to mistakes by the duo which allowed police to quickly find the perpetrators. Evidence was overwhelming in pointing to their guilt. Most dramatically, the misplacing of Leopold's reading glasses, which were found near the victim's body about 25 miles south of Chicago in a park in Hammond, Indiana. Teenagers were questioned in the murder just days later, and each confessed to the crime within the week. A subsequent murder trial was covered by media from around the globe, with one of the most famous newspaper publishers of the era, William Randolph Hearst, even offering to pay Sigmund Freud $500,000 if he would sit in on the trial and offer his analysis on the psyche of the two killers. But the famous father of psychology declined the offer. Sparing no expenses, the wealthy families of the two murderers hired the preeminent defense attorney of the era. Clarence Darrow to defend their sons. Darrow, who was either directly or indirectly played by numerous actors on screen over the last hundred years, opened the trial by surprising the judge with the news that the two boys wished to change their plea in the case from not guilty to guilty. He delivered one of the most famous closing arguments in legal history, which questioned the practicality of capital punishment. This impassioned eight-hour plea by Darrow may have convinced the judge to sentence both boys to life in prison instead of death sentences. Lowe would be attacked and die in prison a dozen years later, while Leopold wrote a best-selling autobiography in 1958 before being paroled later that year and living the rest of his life in Puerto Rico. There is a plethora of material on the murder and trial, including a recent book I can recommend titled Nothing But the Night, Leopold and Loeb, and the Truth Behind the Murder That Rocked 1920s America. The story was also made into a movie called Compulsion in 1959, released to coincide with the publishing of Leopold's autobiography. This Richard Fleischer-directed movie certainly more closely followed the events of the crime and historical trial but also deliberately avoided using references to the real people involved for legal reasons. In Compulsion, Orson Welles is given top billing credit and plays the Clarence Darrow character, now named Jonathan Wilk, while Dean Stockwell took on Leopold, here he's called Judd Steiner, and Bradford Dillman took on Loeb, here Artie Strauss. But Compulsion was not the first film to tackle Leopold and Loeb. That honor, of course, went to Hitchcock and Rope. And we must return to the title question, how much of Rope is directly based on the Leopold and Loeb crime of the century, and how much is the master of suspense crafting a film to make audiences contemplate the brutality of murder? 
Hitchcock's rope starts off with the murder of a classmate by strangulation in a New York City penthouse apartment. The murderous duo here is Brandon Shaw, played by John Dow, and Philip Morgan, played by Farley Granger. After quickly stuffing the dead body in a trunk in their Manhattan skyrise, Shaw and Morgan host a dinner party for their wealthy friends and housemaster. Over the next 80 minutes, the movie proceeds in real time, as we watch Rupert Cadell, played by James Stewart, slowly start to question what's in the mysterious trunk. As the night progresses, the two killers taunt their friends and former teacher with conversation in double entendre, hinting at the undiscovered murder. The strongest connection between Rope and Leopold and Loeb's murder is Hitchcock's desire to base his 1949 film around Friedrich Nietzsche's Superman concept of Ubermensch. Now, keep in mind that I was mostly taking film courses in college, and therefore was situated as far from my campus philosophy courses as I could humanly be, but I believe Ubermensch to be a concept that postulated there were superhumans who could rise above societal views of morality, and therefore lived by their own self-defined set of values. Later, others would reference this philosophy with the term Superman. At least, that's how this non-philosophy major understands it. If I'm getting this wrong, please be gentle on me on the YouTube comment section. Leopold and Loeb were strong believers in the philosophy, writing letters to each other on the subject that had been preserved more than a century later. With art imitating life, in Rope, Brandon Shaw has a dinner party conversation with his prep school headmaster on the topic. Oh no, oh no. After all, murder is or should be an art, not one of the seven lively, perhaps, but an art nevertheless. And as such, the privilege of committing it should be reserved for those few who are really superior individuals. And the victims, inferior beings whose lives are unimportant anyway. Obviously. Now, mind you, I don't hold with the extremists who feel that there should be open... In my opinion, it's in these debates and confrontations between James Stewart and the murderers that viewers can see most clearly Hitchcock's desire to stage his drama around the real-life motivations of the 1924 crime of the century. Much of the nuances of the real-life crime, including the relationship between the two killers, is also never fully addressed in the movie. At best, it's only hinted at. Take the homosexual relationship between Leopold and Loeb, for instance. Hitchcock implies their relation, but he never states it outright. On the flip side though, some plot elements are only evident in the film rope, including the fiancé character Janet and her former boyfriend Kenneth being manipulated by Shaw at the party, as well as the role of the housekeeper and her unintended assistance in the covering up of the dead body stuffed in the trunk. The most important part of the real Leopold and Loeb crime that is not addressed in the movie is the murder trial and the spirited defense arguments led by Clarence Darrow. Rope is pretty much shown in real time, and ends with James Stewart's character alerting the New York City authorities to the murder, as the audience sees the defeated characters of Shaw and Morgan await their pending arrests. Rope was never intended to be a courtroom drama, yet it's pretty much impossible not to associate the original murder with the subsequent trial. Stewart's headmaster character serves as the moral judge in the film and audiences left the theater at the end of the movie fairly well versed in the ultimate fates of the two main characters. We don't need to see another hour. We know Shaw and Morgan are going to jail. But in the real case, despite the odds certainly being stacked against the teenage murderers, Clarence Darrow was able to deliver an impassioned argument as to why his clients should be spared the death penalty, which they were. Avoiding the insertion of a more true-to-reality Darrow character provided Hitchcock a stronger narrative that worked within his desired one-take structure. But for true historians, Rope really should not be seen as a substitute for researching the specifics of the 1924 murder. I've mentioned Rope's one-take structure in passing, but this truly unique visual flair is perhaps Hitchcock's most impressive camera work of all time, more than the shower scene in Psycho maybe even more than the staging of Rear Window. Rope is best known for its relatively seamless method of stitching together long takes into a final product that looks like it was continuously filmed. Although many film directors have experimented with long takes, what Hitchcock achieved in Rope was revolutionary. Since the film was Hitchcock's first to be shot in Technicolor, it meant that each scene could only consist of 952 feet of film 
for about nine minutes at most. The technical setup of this very specific filming need also meant that coordination of the movie's direction, staging, acting, and editing would have to be precise, requiring multiple rehearsals and making the filming seem perhaps more like a play than a movie. All interior action was filmed on a single set, with designer Perry Ferguson creating a penthouse apartment hanging from ceiling U-tracks so the cameras could freely move through the set. The carpeted floor was reinforced with extra felt and soundproof materials to muffle all sounds. Everything was placed within pre-designated circles with director of photography Joseph A. Valentine in charge of shooting his third Hitchcock film. With the real-time aspect of the film shoot being vital to the storytelling, an intricate New York City backdrop would be necessary, and thus a 12,000 square foot cyclorama was created, which was actually three times wider than the apartment set. This backdrop incorporated about 35 miles of Manhattan skyline and included such famous landmarks as the Empire State Building, Chrysler and Woolworth Buildings, Radio City Music Hall, and also allowed the director to make his standard film cameo. The backdrop also allowed Hitchcock to incorporate neon hues into the ending of the movie, which up to that point had used pretty much more subdued colors. All told, filming took 18 days of production, with more than half of that devoted to rehearsals. Hitchcock, displeased with the film's ending depiction of the sunset, did reshoot some of the final reels of the movie. It was mostly a financial and critical success, but in subsequent years, more emphasis was placed on its technical achievements and structure than its story. In the landmark 1967 book, Hitchcock by Francois Truffaut, the director is quoted with these comments about Rope. I undertook rope as a stunt, that's the only way I can describe it. When I look back, I realize that it was quite nonsensical because I was breaking with my own theories on the importance of cutting and montage for the visual narration of a story. But as a fan of history, I love the story of rope. Still, I wanted to answer a very specific question with today's video. Is rope fact or fiction? And I wasn't satisfied with what I've learned so far. So I reached out to the experts. Greg King and Penny Wilson, authors of the aforementioned Leopold and Loeb book. And to my surprise, Greg King actually responded. He wrote to me, Rope was admittedly based on the Leopold and Loeb case. The switch was that, in it, it was the older teacher who imbued the young men with Nietzsche-inspired philosophy, which led to the murder. Whereas in real life, it was only Nathan Leopold who was enamored of it. So King is certainly a believer that it's more fact than fiction but Rope is certainly held back slightly by the limitations of the film medium. In addition to the one-shot technique, much of the brutality of the original 1924 crime and behaviors of its perpetrators were muted and watered down to appeal to censors. And thus, it can't really pass the test of being an accurate retelling of one of the most brutal crimes of the Roaring Twenties. More a spiritual retelling. But where does Rope rank on your list of favorite Hitchcock films? We plan on creating more videos in the future on the master of suspense, so we certainly want to hear your thoughts and ideas for future video suggestions. In the meantime, please help our channel and community continue to grow by liking this video or subscribing if you haven't yet done so. We appreciate your support as always, and until the next time, I'll see you at the movies.